Welcome back to Feed the Post. I am your host, Joe Jackson. Today, we are back with another Big Ten team preview, getting closer to the start of the season. I am joined by Jeff Ehrman of InsideMDSports.com. Going to talk through the Maryland Terrapins, um, and, and I think a kind of underrated, exciting team in the Big Ten this season. Jeff, I appreciate you coming on for a bit and talking Maryland. Absolutely, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So last year, obviously, we're going to talk. We'll talk a little bit about them. Not too much. Last season was not one that Maryland or Maryland fans wanted. Uh, 16 and 17, 7 and 13 in Big Ten play. Really struggled offensively. Still a good defense. Um, When you kind of look back at the season now, though, that we're a few months removed, what are your thoughts surrounding it? Um, I mean, I think it was obviously a total disappointment from, from Maryland's point of view. You know, they were... Uh, so poor shooting the ball all season. It's one thing to get a sporadic, you know, a little wind streak here and there, and then a, hit a little funk or cold streak for them, though. You didn't even have those, you know, those peaks and valleys. It was just like a season long valley with no real winning streak. You know, the, the three point shooting, I believe they're second nationally, second worst nationally, I should say, among power conference teams at about 27 percent from three so that's obviously by far the biggest thing that they need to improve upon this year but you know i think for everybody surrounding the program last year was you know not not acceptable you know it's the first losing record under a non-interim coach for maryland in 30 years so that's oh, wow. all i think yeah i didn't i did not know that last part uh but yeah i mean you hit it like the the season's obviously disappointing at that point shooting's a big part because i remember their uh Whatever whatever tournament they were in early on, where they dropped a couple games, um, I still came well. I still came away from that being like this could be a good team because they just need to make shots at some point, and that point just never came to happen, unfortunately for Maryland. But um, don't don't want to spend too much time on last season, so we will move on to the off season. A lot of roster changes, two freshmen, five transfers. Plus, you had. Maryland has two red shirts from last season um, and Brayden Pierce and Chance Stevens who didn't play. So really only returning four players that gave minutes to the Terrapins from last season. Um, what are kind of your thoughts on the off season and kind of the guys that were able to be brought in? Yeah, I mean, I think Kevin Willard did a good job rebuilding the roster. Obviously the big splash is Derek Queen, the five-star center. Uh, who was McDonald's All-American Game MVP, you know, has been a five-star throughout his high school career, one of the most highly ranked recruits Maryland has signed in many years. Uh, so that's a huge addition, obviously. It doesn't necessarily address the biggest need that we discussed a minute ago with outside shooting, but, you know, he's such an all-around talent in terms of passing ability and versatility and, you know, his, his physical strength and his offensive skill that he's the guy who should come in and lift your level of play significantly by himself as a freshman, which is pretty rare these days, especially with freshmen just struggling everywhere to compete against these, what seems like every team has, you know, a few ninth year seniors effectively. Uh, and then the backcourt, you know, um, they, they did a good job there too. I think Jacoby Gillespie will be really good, whether he can beat Jameer Young. I don't know. That's a tall task, but he was excellent at Belmont. You know, we've seen players from that conference, uh, the Ohio Valley Conference, have a lot of success at higher levels, obviously. So, you know, there's probably a little bit of credence you put into that in, in terms of how he'll translate. Um, Celta Miguel was the was the AAC Sixth Man of the Year and also an All Conference Defensive Player. Guy uh, shoots the ball really well. It, there's a lot of buzz on him recently. You know, they, they feel like he's going to be a, a big impact guy. And then obviously the other biggest name would be Rodney Rice, the guard transfer from Virginia Tech, was a top 75-ish kind of guy coming out of DeMapo, went to Virginia Tech, didn't didn't really like it there. And so now he's, you know, he's not a known commodity because he hasn't done it in college, but he's also a guy who, you know, a lot of people are familiar with and feel like he can be a, at least a significant uh, offensive player at the college level. Yeah, I I really like what Willard did this offseason. Obviously, Derek Queen, um, being able to get him is huge. And we're, we'll talk about more kind of all these players a little more in depth. We'll go kind of position group by position group. But um, I think Celton Miguel is one of the more underrated transfers in the Big Ten. Like, I, I think, like, watching him play, it's just like, yeah, he's 
literally exactly what Maryland needs, especially out of the wing spot. Um, Gillespie, like you said, can he be Jameer Young? I don't know. I don't know if it's fair to have that pressure put on him, uh, but very, very good player should be easily be able to be a lead guard in the Big Ten. Like, I think there's just a lot of good pieces, like you said, Rodney Rice, or even a like Malachi Palmer is um, an older, he'll be an older freshman. Uh, can he contribute right away? Like, there's just different guys that I, I think it's going to be interesting. So we'll move kind of position group by position group is what is kind of how I have these formatted. So starting with the guards, um, and we will start with Jacoby Gillespie. Um, we mentioned already him maybe not being Jameer Young, but in terms of how he's used and play style, do you think it's going to be a lot of what Jameer Young did in terms of just here's the ball, try and go create something? I think it's fairly similar to Jameer. You know, even though he's a small guy, he got to the rim and scored at a very high rate. I think he shot something like somewhere in the 65% or 75, 70% range at the rim last year. Uh, you know, I think he will be a little bit more of a distributor than Jameer. Jameer might have also been taking a few more shots just because his teammates weren't really hitting them. So you couldn't blame him for that. You know, that might have factored somewhat into his style of play. But I think that, that Stylistically, they should be a little bit similar. Gillespie is not the elite athlete that Jameer was, but he's still athletic enough. And, you know, from what, what I've heard from people over at Maryland, he's very well built for his size. So they feel like he'll be able to hold up well against Big Ten competition. Yeah, and I think he's probably, like like you said, he's not probably as athletic or maybe won't finish quite as well at the rim, but I do think he's a better shooter um, now. Jameer Young also had to take a bunch of shots, so I guess that factors in a little bit too to his percentages in that. But I trust Gillespie as a shooter. Struggled his freshman year. Um, really bounced back last season. His sophomore year shot 39% from three. Obviously, that would be huge for Maryland if he continue can continue even anywhere near that area. Um, another guy that's... I like. I was very, very excited to watch him last season, and then he did have the, uh, I think, torn ACL, Chance Stevens, um, and missed the whole season. Um, what are you like, what are you kind of expecting to see from him this year? Obviously coming off of injury, so that can always take time, but like, do you just think how well he shoots the ball is just going to find him minutes? Yeah, that's exactly it. It never has ever been a more probably defined role for a player. They need him to come in and knock down threes. I mean, obviously we've seen, you know, on social media, the videos where he's just basically making threes like their layups. I think he said his record this summer was something like 75 in a row from the same spot, which, you know, you don't have anybody defending you, so it's entirely different. But that's still the, the numbers he shoots at, even in an open gym, are pretty uh, pretty impressive. Now, the question, you know, he's kind of more of a slight guy. He's not a big guy. So if, on the other end of the court, is he going to be able to hold up defensively is a question. So we'll have to see just because, it's, you know, he hasn't had a chance to prove it yet. He played at a much lower level, Loyola Marymount, for one year. You know, in high school, he wasn't necessarily the guy that all the schools nationally wanted. So when you come in with that and you're hoping to be a guy on this level of play, you know, it's 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 always far from a sure thing. But I think, you know, having watched him in, in you know, practice this summer a little bit and watching the videos, he at least has that potential to be kind of that designated shooter that they sorely missed last season. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's, I, I think he would have been a huge boost last season for them. Um, I really trust his ability to shoot the ball. What else he can, can he do? I think that's, like you said, a little more up in the air, especially on the defensive side. Although I think Maryland's system can kind of cover it a bit. Uh, the other guard I want to hit on is Jahari Long and who I think quietly had a solid season in a backup and kind of the reserve role on a team that obviously underperformed. Um, he's now what come, he came back for his fifth year. Like he has a lot of experience. Do you think he'll be a guy that maybe he's not like the go-to guy or anything like that, but just a guy Maryland can continue to rely on in potentially that kind of sixth, seventh man role? Well, as of, you know, a couple months ago, it sounded like there's a chance he won't play this year. He had some terrible luck towards ACL in the uh, final minutes of a blowout loss yeah. uh, in the Big Ten tournament against Wisconsin. So when you suffer it that late in the year, Obviously, the following year is kind of up in the air. I think there's a chance he'll play if he does. I, I agree with you, Joe. I like him. I think he's a he's a winning kind of player, even if the field goal or three point percentage isn't always necessarily what you what you want. He's a guy who's going to push the ball. He makes the, the, the smart pass. 
He plays really hard. He's just one of those kind of steady veteran guys who can really help a team. So if if he's healthy, which remains to be seen, and they might not even know still based on his recovery pace, uh, I do think he can help them win some games. Yeah, I def- just going to be honest, totally forgot about the, the ACL thing yeah. with him. Um, yeah, that obviously is <laughs> is a very important thing to know with that. Um, so yeah, hopefully he's able to come back or, or just more than anything, hopefully he's able to recover healthy and all of that. And whether we see him this year, potentially next year, assuming he would get the red shirt if he wants it. So uh, we'll jump from the guards room. Uh, well, I guess actually that brings up a question for me is like, is Jalen Young going to be more important then, uh, assuming Long is at least missing some period, if not the whole season? I think he'll, yeah, he'll play some, mostly because of Jahari Long. You know, they have a lot of guards right now. It's hard to know who's going to do what. None of these none of these guys are tested at this level. The one guy who is Deshaun Harris-Smith, and he really struggled last year, so you know, I don't expect Jalen Jalen Young to be one of their leading scorers, but when you have that many unknowns coming into the lineup, uh, you know, I think there's a good chance he'll he'll get a chance to to be a presence there, at least you know, coming off the bench, whether that's ten or fifteen minutes a game, something like that. It largely depends on how well those guards play in front of him. Yeah, for sure, and I think we do have to talk about Deshaun Harris Smith. Um, top was he a top fifty recruit? I believe. Um, yeah, and sh- struggled struggled last season. Um, yeah. lots of hype. I think coming into the season for him. What are your thoughts on like a breakout year kind of in season two for him now? Now that he's he's had a full year under the belt, it's not unheard of for you know a good for, for a highly ranked freshman to struggle for a year, and then year two they just pick it up and go. Do you think that's um how likely do you think that is? I guess for Deshaun Harris Smith. I mean, it really needs to happen for them. He was kind of the gem last year of their class, much like Derek Queen is this year. Uh, really struggled with the outside shot all year. Looked discouraged for much of the year, you know, kind of down uh, body language. Obviously, coming out of high school, like you said, he was highly rated. I think he ended up at number 25 in our mm. final rankings of 24-7 sports. So when you get a guy who's in the top 25, you're, you're expecting – immediate impact obviously like i mentioned you know a lot of those kind of guys aren't doing what they would have done five or ten years ago because there's so many older guys playing now it's a little tougher to make that transition but you know given what was expected of him given his his size and toughness and ability and you know probably versatility playing a little bit of the two and the three maybe a little bit of the one you know he doesn't have to be a star this year but he needs to be you know, a capable slash above average, I would say, Big Ten player for them. And, you know, given the raw material that he has, you would think he'll get there. But then again, you know, a lot more was expected of him last year. Yeah, for sure. Like he has all the tools. It's just putting it together, maybe a um, better, potentially a little bit better offensive system might just help him in general to try to create some spacing. And it's also always tough when at times he was getting the like, we're just going to let him shoot treatments of you're like, you're wide open by 15 feet and you're missing. And I feel like that can just get in your head as well. So um, maybe just an early season kind of, if he's able to knock down some shots just to get the confidence, that'll be big. We mentioned Celta Miguel off the top. Um, and I, now I want to dive into him a bit more. I, I think he's, like I said, one of the most underrated transfers um, really in the big 10. Like he's going to be a three and D guy. He shot the ball really well from three last season at, uh, what was it? 39% from three really good defensive player. Um, is, is, is it just going to be a lot of defensive stuff and then shoot the ball from three? Or do you think he could get into like a creator type role if needed for Maryland? I think he'll do some slashing too. I don't think they see him as a facilitator. He's going to really run the offense unless there's an emergency, but yeah, that's what they want from his, him. It's the toughness. You know, they say he's an extremely confident guy, really high-level competitor. So play play defense as everyone's expected to do, you know, in Kevin Willard's system and then knock down threes would be the majority of it. But I'm, I'm sure he'll do some stuff going to the basket. But, you know, I think in terms of the one, you'll probably see it more uh, Gillespie and maybe Rodney Rice there and Jalen Young. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, do you do you see any hiccup with him trans like making the jump from the AAC to the Big Ten, or do you think he kind of has 
Celton Miguel, I mean, have the Big Ten game kind of already? Yeah, I don't see that because he's a grown man, you know, very mature, very strong physically. You know, and the AAC is not the Big Ten, but it's legitimate competition. So if you're the sixth man of the year and and on the all-defensive team, I think that's still some, some pretty qualifying accolades. So, no, I, I don't think he'll struggle. To, you know, I think you probably would worry a little more maybe about Gillespie just at his size and in a lower-level conference. But uh, I, think, I think Miguel should be fine. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Um, you mentioned Rodney Rice, who's transferred from Virginia Tech. High-rated high recruits, just never really found a fit or a role at Virginia Tech. Um, how, I guess, like, how big of a role could he get? Because I, I think the talent's there. It's just fit hasn't been at all. Um, do you think that this fit could lead to, like, a bigger role for him than we've seen the past, you know, couple years for him? Yeah, I think that he can be a you know a fairly consistent scorer for them. I don't think he's necessarily a guy you're going to have for long stretches at the point. I know he feels like he can play some point and is hoping to be you know kind of the backup or at least get minutes there because that's where he views his future. But you know the rep on him coming out of high school was the same big time shot maker. Maybe not you know a, a pure designated shooter like Chance Stevens, but can can hit the three pretty consistently. Scores in the mid range just that gym rat kind of guy who just looks like he was, you know, kind of made to score the basketball defensively. He'll have to prove himself. Obviously, he'll have to prove himself because he hasn't played in forever, you know, since going to Virginia Tech and yeah. things not working out there. So he's kind of a mystery and a wild card to a lot of people just because he had that pretty good high school rep, but really has kind of disappeared since then. But I think he'll, I think he's clearly capable of giving them some scoring uh, in the backcourt, I think he's, you know, he, he has the pedigree of a player who can thrive on um, this level. Yeah, for sure. And I, I agree. I'm excited to see what he can do, most likely in somewhat limited role, uh, I think. But either way, excited to see what he can do. Um, moving on to kind of the, I'll call them like the wing forwards of the team of Jordan Geronimo and Tafari Gapari. Um We'll, we'll talk about Reese and Derek Queen in a minute, and that does play a big factor into how many minutes these two get in Geronimo and Kapari. But uh, how do you see them fitting into this team? Are they going to be more like just pure fours and they're going to probably be more kind of tried to be defensive guys because um, both of them have some offensive limits? Or do you think do you think there's a scenario where they both kind of get pushed out if like Queen and, and Reese really, really just mesh? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, the two of them will probably be competing for minutes. Geronimo, a little more of a proven commodity, did not shoot the three well at all last year, kind of like everybody else on the team had shot it significantly better at Indiana. But he did showcase some, you know, really high-level athleticism, the kind of guy who can give you those little energy plays and dunks and blocks and things like that. Uh, obviously, if he's, if he's shooting the three like last year, that could limit him a little bit. But then on the flip side, you know, Gapare hasn't shot well either. His three-point numbers are, are really poor. Uh, he is athletic. You know, I've heard he's actually the fastest guy on the team at about 6'8". But he's a good athlete. He's a guy that I feel like has a lot of upside. He was a top 60-ish recruit coming out of high school a few years ago. Haven't that He hasn't been able to, um, you know, produce at that level, on the college level quite yet. But he does have some raw things that are hard to teach. So. You know, they say he's coming along well. They say he shot the belt ball well this summer. If those things are true, he could have a pretty good role off the bench because, you know, they don't plan to play. According to Kevin Willard, he only plans to play Queen and Reese together for, you know, around a dozen minutes a game. So that would seemingly mean, you know, a good number of minutes for some of these other front court guys. Okay. And that's, that's that was actually my next question was how much do you think we see the Reese Queen pairing together? Because they're two of Maryland's best players. They do they play the same position and have sim. they have similar skill sets in terms of like spacing the floor in that. Um, I, I think they have different qualities to them themselves, but uh, you said about a dozen minutes a game. How do you see that pairing working in those, you know, 10, we'll say 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. I mean, Willard said 10 to 15, but if they end up being their two best players by far, which is quite possible, you might change your tune unless, of course, defensively you're struggling to chase other teams around the perimeter because there's not many teams with two 6'10-ish kind of guys yeah. uh, on the court at the same time. If that works out defensively, it could be a different story. But I think, 
you'll see Reese at the five and Queen of the four when they're on the court together. Queen shoots it a lot better from outside. He's a little more of a skilled passer, whereas Reese has learned to become, you know, a bully under the basket. So when they are on the court, I think it's going to be, I think Reese will be the five, maybe not exclusively, but most of the time. And, you know, we'll see how many minutes they can, they can play together. Yeah. And I think you mentioned the passing and the facilitating from Queen. I think that's the big skill that gives me hope for the pairing of like, I think there's a very real scenario. Queen's just an elite passer at the college level, like from day one. Some of the passes he made in high school is just like, man, like uh, point guards don't make those passes. And he's doing it at what, six, six, ten or whatever he's listed at. Um, but then you mentioned defense is you're playing essentially two true centers defensively. How does that work? Um, now Maryland plays a lot of zone and that could cover things potentially. But even then, I mean, it, it can work. It can't work. You could, you look at IU last year with the new wear pairing of where was good defensively, but how many times was renewed just kind of lost out on the perimeter. Um, and, and, and that's kind of this, a similar ish front court vibe to me of what these two could be. I think they could maybe be a bit better in terms of just how they fit together. Uh, but that's what it's going to be. And, and it's going to be interesting to see with in, in theory, if queen and Reese are only playing 10 to 15 together, Reese is going to assuming Reese doesn't get in foul trouble. He'll play what probably like, 30 to 32 minutes if he can handle more. Do you think those two just take all the minutes at the five, or is there a scenario where Braden Pierce, um, redshirt freshman, can kind of squeak in a few minutes? Yeah, I think he's going to play. The plan is him for, for him to play, whether that's five minutes or 12 minutes a game. It's probably just going to be determined by how well he can defend. That's what they, they know he can shoot. That's been his uh, calling card as being a big man who can shoot the three. I've seen him in – shooting it around and he does have a soft touch from outside, but you know, the biggest thing they, they want him to be able to spell Reese at the center for a few minutes here and there uh, defensively. So yeah, I, I'd be surprised if he doesn't play. Now, if he goes out there and really struggles from the jump, then things can change. But I think the plan is definitely to, to get him in for a few spells per game. Yeah, for sure. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm excited to see what he can do. I know he's a younger guy, like in terms of he hasn't played basketball for an insane amount of time compared to a lot of these guys. Um, so yeah, having a full, like a red shirt year for him is big for sure. Um, I think where I want to go next for a little bit is the offense. And it kind of pairs with Julian Reese of like, I think Reese still had a solid year. I think Reese can have a much better year. Do you think some of it is just going to be as simple as having better spacing, having, um, better kind of playmakers around Reese will almost just allow him to get easier looks. Not that he's sh- not that he was bad at all last year. That's not what I'm saying, but just get to that really like star star level that Reese has in him. Yeah. I think that, I think that'll help a lot if these guys can knock down shots. That makes it tough because they were just doubling him constantly with no fear, you know, and, and that's, there's not many big men in the country who, you know, maybe Zach Eady who could really thrive in that situation. Some of it, you know, was self-inflicted free throw shooting remains a problem. Um, his fouls remain a problem. Have That's been something that's limited his minutes throughout his career. So he does need to, you know, I'm told he's gotten a lot bigger and stronger over the off season, but those, those would be the two biggest things for him aside from guys, obviously helping him out and hitting some shots to get the defense off of him. Uh, he, for him, for the, this team to reach its potential and him to reach his potential, he needs to hit, hit more of the free throws and, you know, yeah. stay out of foul trouble more often. Yeah, for sure. And kind of with that, with now you have two very, very good is at probably minimum big men, uh, potentially like two elite big men. Do you see more of the offense just being kind of in the post or at, if it's Derek queen, maybe like a high, low look at the high post between him and Reese. Um, or do you see these guards like Gillespie and uh, I know Miguel's more of like a wing, but these type of guys still giving the balance on the perimeter where it is still a lot of perimeter creation. Well, Willard likes to let his guards do whatever they want for the most part, but I do think this year uh, it will be more post oriented, you know, kick it in, see if somebody, if, if, the, if you can get a bucket there, find an open shooter because, you know, you have to accentuate your strengths and the reality is, there's potential for all these guards, but there's not a guy, there's not a guard on the roster who's proven at this level. Um, so, you know, 
I don't think you have any choice when when you have when your talent is is concentrated so much at one spot. Willard's smart enough that I think he's going to have to really emphasize the post this year. And yeah, it works. It's harder and harder to do that. Let fewer and fewer teams are doing it, especially with anybody everybody making so many threes. But that's clearly where their strength lies. Yeah, for sure. And, and it'll be interesting to see the balance. Uh, moving to the defensive side, Willard's kind of shown, especially in his two seasons at Maryland, Maryland, uh, what the defense is going to be. It's going to be good. It's going to be you know trying to force a lot of turnovers. Um, have some zone, have some press. Do you see there, like, is there any reason to believe it's going to be anything different than what it's been the past two years in terms of the defensive side of the ball? I don't think so, Joe. I think that's pretty much his identity at this point. You know, maybe you pre- he, he did have a spell of, you know, pressing work to times for him last year when they were looking to create some offense since the jumpers weren't falling. But then again, if you have Queen and Reese on the floor, it's going to be really hard to press. Or like you said, maybe you zone a little more to hide the fact that you have two big guys out there. So that that's a possibility too. But you know that that um, all out kind of ferocious defensive energy. You know that's going to be the the personality of his teams forever. Yeah, for sure. And I like that's where I really like the guards and wings that he got. Like I think really all of them I buy as league at least solid defenders. And some of them I think can be pretty elite defenders. A um, couple kind of quick hitters. We don't spend too much time and then we'll get out of here. Who do you think will be the most impactful newcomer next season for this team? I think it's probably Gillespie just because he's running the point. And so the point obviously has an inordinate level of importance, like the quarterback in football, but I think it might be close. I think everything I've heard about Selton Miguel is that he's a real deal. They think he's going to come in and and be a big time player. So I think he's got a chance to be that guy. Also, I mean Queen, obviously, you know, if you didn't have Julian Reese there and Queen was just soaking in thirty minutes a game, I'd probably pick him. But um, but otherwise, at least just in terms of the transfers, I'd say probably Gillespie by a hair. Yeah, that's that's where I would lean to. Um, I think maybe Queen has like the highest ceiling. Like if things just if everything just works, then maybe Queen's just this monster. Uh, but I would agree with Gillespie. Uh, who is the X factor to you on this team this season? Yeah, it's got to be Harris Smith. I mean, he's got the yeah. tool to at least be a really good player. Maybe not quite the level that some people projected him at coming out of high school. But you know, when he's the one guy returning, who's that? A high level recruit with high expectations. He's got a year in the system under his belt, unlike all these new transfers. Uh, you know, his ability to take another step, improve, and be a guy you can rely upon is going to be a huge factor in whether they're able to, you know, have a successful season. So he to me, he's the the undoubted uh X factor for them. Yeah, I got I got nothing on top of that. I totally agree with with everything you said. Uh last thing is and you don't have to go like crazy in depth on this, but like, what do you think is the floor and the ceiling of this team? And just like a little bit on how those scenarios happen. Well, I think, I mean, the floor is, I, I think they will be better than last year, but the floor is that, that these transfers aren't as good as you hope. They don't all mesh together as well. And it's difficult integrating the two big men together. And then you miss the tournament again. And then people are not going to be happy if it ends like that, obviously. Um, and the ceiling, you know, it's funny. I listened to an interview the other day with Randolph Childress, the former Wake Forest star. He had DC guy who's watched them a lot, and he felt like they have a chance to be in the mix for the Big Ten title. And that might be a little high, but it's pretty rare for any team in college these days to have two bigs of that caliber. So, you know, I think when you add that to the upside of some of these new guys coming in, if everyone, if those upside, th- those new guys all pan out and clean is what we expect. Uh, they should be easily a tournament team, you know, with the chance to make a little noise, which obviously Maryland has not done in March in quite a while. So I'm sure the fans would be happy if that happened. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there, as I've gone through like my Big Ten preview series, Maryland's the team that just quietly keeps creeping up like my rankings. It's just like, oh yeah, a little bit more and more. It's like, no, I do like this team and, and I like what they can bring. And I'm very excited to see what they do this year. So uh Jeff, appreciate you coming on and talking Maryland. Let everybody know where they can find you and your work. Yeah, my uh I'm at inside mdsports.com. We're on the 247 sports slash CBS sports network. And then on Twitter I'm Jeff underscore E R M A N N. 
yeah, so definitely go go give his stuff a follow. You can find me on Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB. If you're looking for more Maryland preview content, um, I will have a film breakdown that should be up already. So definitely go check that out. Also have an individualized breakdown of every Maryland newcomer up on my YouTube as well. So appreciate everybody tuning in and we will catch you in the next one.